Hi there and welcome. Today we're going to be doing a wine tasting. Here we have a South African uh, Shiraz um, called Porcupine Ridge. It's 2019, uh, coming from the Swanland area. Um, so this should be a nice, nice bold wine. What we're going to do first actually is do a quick bit of, uh, for me it's revision, um, for, for others it might be a bit of learning. Um, well, I'll be, doing, I'll be doing some learning as well. I've got some um, some wine books here. I've got um, some wine education books. I've got the World Atlas of Wine um, and some slightly uh, more fun uh, uh, books here as well. And we're just going to quickly look through and see what these wines say about Shiraz. So, first thing to address when picking a bottle of or picking Shiraz, um, is that this wine actually goes, or this grape actually goes by two names. And these two names kind of indicate um, one kind of location, but also um, kind of more importantly is, is style of the wine. So uh, Syrah and Shiraz are the same grape, they're exactly the same. Um, and in kind of old world places, so uh, this refers to places that have grown well, essentially grown wine for a longer time and produced wine for a longer time. So these, these are sort of uh, France, uh, Italy and Spain, um, so sort of more European, that kind of European cluster. Um, in those places the grape is known as um, Syrah, Syrah. Um, and in new, new world places such so as Australia, South Africa, New Zealand, um, etc. Um, it's generally known as Shiraz. However, there's a caveat there because if a wine is produced in a new world location like Australia, but it's essentially trying to replicate, mimic, or um, take inspiration from um, the style of wine that you might find in France, uh, in, in the Rhone Valley, for example, then they might call it Syrah. Uh, and it's kind of a little clue, indicator, um, sort of telling you what the style of wine is kind of intended to be. and. Um, yeah, what you sort of might be tasting and the kind of fullness and richness. Um, so starting off with our um, WSCT book, and here it tells us about the grape, and Syrah is actually a little bit like a Cabernet Sauvignon, so it's got a thicker skin, uh, which is going to contribute tannin, it's got um, black fruit flavour, and it's sort of darkly coloured, so it's quite, it's quite a rich wine, tannic wine, um, dark fruits, um, and it also develops spicy notes as well. Um, so spice you will find in Cabernet Sauvignon, um, Syrah has those qualities as well. And when we say spice, we don't mean um, chilli spice, we're sort of talking about spices that you might find in your kind of cabinet or um, in confectionery or um, whatever it may be. So it could be sort of aniseed, it could be um, licorice like you might find in, um, in Shiraz. Um, it could be a, you know, a whole multitude of things, um, basically any kind of spice that you can think of uh, can pretty much end in uh, end up in a wine, but it's um, a lot of the time actually it's going to be sort of black pepper spice or peppery spice. Um, so I guess there is some kind of similarity there between um, sort of chili spice in a way. For me personally, spice can actually get in the, slightly in the way of fruit flavors. Um, they can kind of compete, and you'll find this with certain wines um, that the primary. Uh, Flavor or the kind of most intense flavor is that spiciness in there. Um, so those might, you know, might be great wines for kind of barbecue and that sort of thing. Now it's interesting to note here that um, South African Shiraz actually come, comes under other locations in our WSET book. So it's not the most um, prominent location for, for uh, Shiraz. And so here we have a book called Wine Simple. So it kind of gives us a simplistic overview. So it's going to tell us about the flavours. We've got black pepper, olive, dark fruit. And dark fruit refers to kind of blackberries and blueberries, that sort of thing. Juicy, lush, spice-driven wine. Um, and yeah, so from the Northern Road in Australia are two are sort of two prominent places that you'll find it. Um, anything else in here? So an interesting uh, use of the word here, jammy. So jammy a wine uh, tends to refer to wines grown in warmer climates. So a grape, as it, as it ripens on the vine, um, is going to develop different types of flavours kind of along that, along that process of ripening. 
So if you've got a sunnier, um, a sunnier place, a warmer climate, like you might find in Australia and South Africa, the, the ripeness is going to develop and you're going to get more developed flavours. Um, so that's where you might start getting stew fruit, kind of jam and, and that sort of thing. And it's quite intuitive in our, in our, kind of, in our heads, in our brains, um, that you know, a kind of fresh blackberry flavour um, in one location, if you, if you, if you make that um, sort of riper, if you, if you put it in a warmer climate, then that might turn into a jammy black, uh, blackberry flavour instead, or a stewed blackberry. Um, so that kind of makes sense, and that's reflected in wine. And also, there's kind of a sweetness there as well. And when I say sweetness, I don't necessarily mean sugar. Um, it might be sugar in the grape, but in, in the results of wine, you're not really going to be um, seeing too much sugar, especially in the case of red wine. Um, so it's more the kind of the sweetness of the, that kind of flavour, that, um, that profile. The same way in teas, for example, you kind of have those sweeter smells, sweet, sweeter aromas. Um, it doesn't necessarily actually refer to sugar. Well, in the case of tea, it doesn't refer to sugar. Um, well, I suppose you could argue there might be trace, uh, sort of trace compounds in there from the leaf. So here again, um, the grape is referred to as sirha, um, syrup. Um, and that's essentially just, again, sort of telling us where this, this, this grape originally comes from. And we've got lots of different stuff here, we've got loads of different flavours, lots of different uh, smoky flavours. Um, you've got espresso, tobacco, um, leather, cured meat, graphite, a eucalyptus and sage, a licorice, green peppercorn, star anise. Um, and then on the fruit flavours, blackberry, plum, blueberry, um, black olive li li listed under black fruit, which is interesting. Um, cherry, red plum, fruit cake, raisin. So that raisin flavour is going to come from that kind of warmer climate. They yeah, are real nice array of, um, of flavours here. Um, so some of those flavours are going to be contributed by oak, which you will find in this wine. And uh, quite often, um, Shiraz and Syrah uh, are uh, wines that we you'll find oak in. So we have our wine atlas here, and I might bring actually uh, the phone around to have a look at this. Um, in fact, yeah. So yeah, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring the phone around, and we can have a look look at the atlas. So this is the uh, the world wine atlas of wine, and let's get the, uh, the exact name. Oh goodness me, the world atlas of wine. There we go, the eighth edition. Um, so this is kind of. Uh, a somewhat of a Bible. It's kind of a, it's got a special place in amongst sort of uh, people in the wine industry. Um, and this really tells us, kind of shows us kind of locations here. Um, and it gives us, it gives us a nice sort of background. So what we're going to look at um, in particular is um, the Swartland, but also moving into um, the area that this wine comes from kind of borders um, Swartland. Um, so here we have Stellenbosch and Frank Schoen. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Um, but this wine actually does come from this area here. And what we find, um, if we read a little bit here, is that the, um, the Frank Schoen is actually a valley. And um, so valleys are really, really important for, for wine. Um, valleys can create kind of microclimates. They can create areas of coolness. Um, areas of, um, of slopes, obviously, that are going to get more sun. Um, so here we go. It's actually recognises a kind of own, uh, own region. Um, and interestingly, um, here we have another fantastically long uh, South African word. We've got, is it Boken Um And in fact, this is the winery that the, uh, the wine today is from. Um, and they do quite an interesting thing. They actually produce some sort of top label wines, but they also have some more affordable wines as well. So the, the Porcupine Ridge is actually one of their more affordable wines. So it's coming around from this area here. Um, if you're good at reading uh, kind of console intervals, <laughs> um, this might mean something to you if you're, into, if you're a geographer. But um, there we go. So we've got Stellenbosch here. And... Um, there we go. It's just on that, just on that border. So it does kind of extend down as well. So I'll quickly open up this wine. A screw cap um, bottle. Now, there's no particular reason to, um, I would 
say, so they discriminate um, with uh, cap bottles. A cork is actually, um, some might say, a bit of an archaic um, invention. I mean, it is. I mean, it's you know, it's probably thousand, you know, thousands of years old, um, and corks allow for a, um, a, a sort of let's let's say quite quite sophisticated aging of wine. Um, it allows a small amount of oxygen in, a kind of a special, almost a special amount of ox oxygen into the wine, uh, into the bottle, just a very, very small amount, which allows it to age over many years. Um, and there's lots of tradition around this, but a, a screw cap essentially means that you're not going to get a fault in your wine, um, which corks uh, very often do. And there's been many cases of um, sort of widespread faults uh, in different areas, uh, winemaking areas, where um, lots and lots of wines have been ruined. So uh, there are special. Uh, uh, screw caps nowadays that do let oxygen in as well so um, that's kind of still uh, in development and I suppose it's going to be a sort of it's a slightly slow development because what we're really looking at is how well the wine ages um, so if you come up with a new technology uh, it's going to take you know maybe five or ten years to actually really kind of um, see those results in the wine. Chemically we don't know too much about um, what the reactions of what's going on um, in that aging process, because they happen over such you know such long periods, and the the chemicals are in such sort of small small quantities. Chemicals, not talking about um, sort of artificially derived, but the naturally occurring chemicals, um, you know, in grapes in in wine. So South Africa has a fantastic advantage um, because the producers tend to be very on it with uh, information. They really like to, uh, from what I've seen, sort of tell you about the wine. Uh, tell you what's going on in their winery, as opposed to the, the kind of old, uh, um, old world places. Like if you're if you're going to look at um, Syrah from uh, from France, they're probably going to tell you a little bit less about what's going on. Um, they'd rather you just taste the wine. So this uh, kind of information age that we live in with uh, food and beverage, it really suits um, suits us that um, South African wineries like giving us information. So this particular wine. Um, Actually has a, a little info sheet that tells us about tells us about the wine, tells us about the winery as well, and the, and the processes. And I've just taken a few notes from that data sheet, um, and I kind of just want to sort of decode those, kind of uncode those. Um, so it mentioned small bunches. Now small bunches are good because, well, first of all, bunches are, are nice because it means that the grapes are going to stay sort of more intact. Um, and if you if you um, press a, a bunch of grapes. And you're also going to get the stems in there as well, um, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's just going to contribute more tannin to the wine. Um, it mentions that they focus on perfume, and this is a, um, a, supposedly a violet perfume in, in this uh, uh, Shiraz. And they aim for um, structure and texture in the wine. So structure in a wine is kind of almost a code word for tannin. Um, and structure, I guess, you know, it's, it's talking about structure in the mouth, so how it feels in your mouth, and that is really to do with tannin. Um, to an extent, alcohol and sugar is going to um, contribute to that structure, but texture is, is more um, sugar, alcohol, or alcohol content, and, um, you know, that might be kind of mouth feel. Um, so in wine, you have light body, medium body, full body, and kind of, you know, the, the sort of small kind of, uh, uh, kind of in, uh, intervals in between that. Um, so because this is South African Shiraz, you're looking at probably more full-bodied wine. Um, now the tannin will be an interesting one. Tannin kind of ripens out of grapes as well. So if you have a hotter climate, uh, the tannins quote unquote ripen. Um, so you still have tannin, uh, but they're softer. They're not as drying and, and astringent as, um, as other tannins. Um, so yeah, they're looking for varietal expression. So this is actually really, really key in, uh, in wine tasting and wine production is whether actually the wine that you make is kind of expressing it, or the grape that you're growing is expressing itself in the result of wine. Um, so this is a relatively affordable wine. It's about six pounds. Uh, I got it for about six pounds uh, in a supermarket. So typically when you buy a wine at that price point, you might not see an expression of the wine. Um, and I suppose this is kind of referring to its kind of key characteristics. So. Uh, if you know that um, Shiraz you know, has black fruit flavour, it has spice, so you might find licorice in there. And in fact, it's given us a few examples as well. So licorice, aniseed, allspice, um, dark plums, black olive again, uh, cured meats again. So 
those are those characteristic flavours, and it's claiming that you can actually taste those in the wine. Um, you might sometimes make it, you know, you might sometimes grow a Shiraz and you don't taste any of those, you just taste maybe like a fruity, a fruity wine that might have, you know, some, maybe some cherry or something, but um, variety of expression is so, so important, and it's what essentially makes a, a wine um, a kind of compelling wine in a way, is whether it's really showing its true, its true character. Uh, and it says it's uh, aged in French barriques, so to, con or to add oak to wine, you can do a variety of things. Um, you can add extract, you can add wood chips, you can add staves, oak staves, um, but the kind of top of the uh, pyramid in, in that kind of whole hierarchy um, is the barrique, uh, barrels, um, and French barriques are the kind of top, um, top stuff, they're, they're kind of the, the, they're the traditional um, barrels. Uh, oak is actually quite hard to um, get, it's quite expensive, uh, there aren't many places that uh, are kind of accepted uh, suppliers of, of oak for, for wine, so uh, French, it's, it's good to see that it's French barriques basically, that's, uh, that's what you want to see. So we've got a few more tasting notes there, um, and I haven't even given this wine a, a, a sniff yet, so we're going to see. So this is a, a tasting glass if you're sort of not familiar with wine. Um, this is going to be about 60 mils of wine. I will be uh, disposing of this wine, I'll be spitting it away uh, just for the tasting of this and that's kind of a, I don't know, that's kind of, I mean at least for me I think it's, it's the, the sort of, the way to taste wine is you're not tasting it, um, you know, for consumption you're tasting it as a kind of inspection almost, uh, as a kind of, um, yeah, as, a, as an evaluation of the wine. Um, so. Let's see what we've got on the nose. Interesting, so it's, there's, there is fruit and there is that secondary sort of, um, it's not secondary technically, but it's, there is that spice um, in there. But there is, there is a, a, a kind of a distraction there for me. It's hard to put my finger on it. Um, it's kind of like a chocolatey note. Um, but there's something, it's almost like a ch it's almost like chocolate mixed with game in a way, um, which is, I'll admit, slightly off-putting. Um, this is, I haven't tasted this wine before, this is the first time I'm ever smelling it. So yeah, almost if you put sort of, uh, I see that it's, you know, you've got black olive on there, so it's almost as if you put, um, chocolate game and kind of mixed it into a tapenade, you know, like an olive, uh, an olive spread, it's kind of got that slight sweetness um, and richness of a chocolate but that savouriness and that's, that's slightly clashing for me. So what you will find with uh, screw cap wines is that they might actually need a little bit of oxygen, um, a little bit of time being open. I mean that's true to an extent for any wines you can kind of make that argument. Uh, typically red wines you sort of want to make that argument as well that they need some time to, to breathe. Um, the exact kind of science and explanation behind all of this is slightly dubious um, and it's it's kind of hard to quantify or really qualify in, in, a, in a way um, but you have that screw cap on there um, and no real oxygen has been allowed to sort of come in contact with the wine so you know if, if let's say you're opening up like a like a jar of something or a tin of something or um, you know a packet you know when you first open it it might smell very different um, to whether you know it's, it's been left out for an hour or, or something like that. So it's, it's kind of along the same lines there. It's kind of just allowing that volatility to kind of um, almost fix itself in a way. Uh, having said that, uh, that kind of clash in, uh, in aroma has, has, slightly, has been slightly mediated, I'd say. Although it is still there. It's, I, let, I let this wine just uh, sit for five minutes while I um, readjust some things and it's... Okay, yeah, so there, so there is that plum. The violet, I wouldn't... Um, I'm hesitant to say that there's violet in there. I would say that there's cured, cured meat. I mean, again, I'm also slightly struggling with the spice here as well. Struggling to, to kind of really kind of pin it down and, and attribute it. Um, 
Usually splice to me is quite noticeable, it tends to kind of uh, dominate. I'd say, yeah, maybe so. I think I could go for some sweet spice. I think the more I smell it, the more I sort of get that kind of licorice. And maybe actually white pepper. Um, white pepper is quite a distinctive, distinctive smell, it's quite different to black pepper. It's one of those things I can sort of pick out. Someone's cooking with white pepper. Um, I can really, I can really smell it. Okay, so I'd say on what they've said on their um, on their fact sheet, I'd say there's there is, there is a lot there that um, they're claiming. So there's sort of the plums, the cured meat, um, licorice, white pepper potentially, um, and obviously you know what they you know how their their sort of uh, the subjectivity of their nose works is, is different to mine, so uh, that's always a difficulty in, in, in tasting and in, in any in any food and beverage sense. You know, you you what your blackberry um, might taste like might be different to mine, um, and especially with wines and aromas, it's not just the blackberry. You know, it's uh, it's all sorts of different things. Um, I guess you know if you were brought up in certain different places in the world as well, you know your sense of um, for example, black currant is, is actually quite an uncommon thing, um, or a common, uh, it's an uncommon flavour around the world, but in Britain, for example, it's, it's very common to have something flavoured as black currant, so um, the kind of language that we use is sometimes slightly, slightly difficult because, uh, you know, we're trying to pinpoint our sort of, our own subjective, uh, our own subjective experience, but there we go. Right, so I'm going to go for, for a taste here. So we're going to see if I can sort of see what's going on with the acidity, tannin, uh, so structure, uh, the body of the wine, the texture. Uh, so here we go. Okay. So um, actually, a nice acidity on the wine. I'd say. Um, usually the way that um, in tasting wine you might try and really close in on that acidity or, or how much acidity is essentially just to see how, um, how much your mouth salivates, salivates after tasting the wine. So on the, on the uh, attack, on the entry, um, as some might call it, there definitely was a nice sharpness there um, which you want to see in, in, in wine so it kind of maintains that balance. And also means that it's going to be a good, um, what's known as a gastronomic wine, so a good, uh, a food wine essentially. Um, so, um, nice acidity there, and I would say actually good tannin as well. So, nice balance of acidity and tannin. Tannin that I felt um, uh, kind of on the side of my cheeks, um, quite satisfying, but not, you know, not overpowering by any means. Um, so, that, that ripeness coming through, that kind of ripe tannin in, in a way coming through. I tend to find that aroma um, really gives you a lot of clues in terms of flavour. But anyway, maybe that kind of almost leatheriness is coming through a bit more, um, that kind of savouriness, and that kind of clashing um, kind of aroma that I kind of identified, I wouldn't say is on the palate particularly. Um, so it's, I'd say it's more, it's kind of a more um, coherent, kind of integrated um, wine on the palate than it is on the nose. And um, I think it kind of does what it says on the tin, really. Um, yeah, so I'd say it's a sort of medium to full body wine. Nice bit of acidity and tannin. So you've got everything there that you kind of expected. Um, and I think there is, there are kind of strands of complexity there that you could tease out in the wine, which is which is something that you kind of really want to look for as well in, in wine. So in terms of discerning a wine's quality, um, we tend to look at intensity. Um, so I actually say this, this wine is actually quite, um, has quite sort of pronounced aroma. And you're also going to be looking for balance. So whether the, the acidity is in balance with the tannin, is in balance with the body, is in tannin, uh, um, balance with the intensity of flavour. Um, so overall, I'd say it's actually quite a good wine. Uh, for the price point, definitely, I think it definitely offers a lot of value. And one thing I did actually notice um, in learning about this wine, um, finding out about 
um, South African Shiraz is that it tends to be almost the, the, uh, the last thing that's mentioned. Um, so in some of these books, they didn't even mention South African Shiraz. Um, so it's kind of almost at the end of the list in a way. And because it's uh, a lesser known and kind of maybe less popular wine in a way, um, South Africa is, as well, I think, struggles um, perhaps in sort of in certain people's perception of it as well, um, in terms of a winemaking region, that is. Um, people might, you know, have much more trust in, in um, the old world, you know, or, you know, they might um, have more of a fixation on kind of maybe like New Zealand, for example, is kind of like a big name. And if you see, you know, a, a New Zealand wine, um, that's associated with quality because they tend to, to you know, produce, produce less wine and it tends to be a higher, higher quality. South Africa is interesting because, because they've got that hot climate, the grapes that they, that they bring down um, in, in South Africa and grow there um, can get a bit, um, can present flavours that are different to what um, you might be used to in the old world. So, you know, just again, sort of more, more northern um, the latitude or longitude, I'm not sure. So, a cooler climate. And certain wines don't do well in, in warm climates. For example, Pinot Noir, um, it essentially loses its character, it kind of loses its elegance. Um, and it just becomes a kind of a bit of a jammy mess. Um, so I think this wine is actually pretty, pretty good, pretty good value. Um, and yeah, it's, this has been an interesting experience learning a bit more about um, the kind of regions in South Africa, um, just, to just to touch more and looking at all the variety of different um, flavour profile and flavours that you can get in these sort of wines. Cool, I think that, uh, that concludes, I've got nothing more to say. That concludes the, um, the tasting for today. So thank you for watching and I uh, hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.